are in episode six, The Drop. We have a special guest in the house today. We're going to get to him in a minute. Thanks for joining us today. It is May 1st. It's going to be May, MK. How are we doing? It's going to be May. <laughs> <laughs> I, was waiting, I was waiting for that. I I had, waiting for I, that. You set me up. I had to take that. Uh, doing good. Down in the dumps today. Uh, obviously, you heard that school for us is closed till hopefully we get back in September. I'm hoping that, but down in the dumps about that. Um, I'm tired. <laughs> I'm tired today. <laughs> I feel like I, my head is just so heavy. I think it's just that that news that came down around noon today that we're not going back. It's uh, it's a tough one to take. It is. Yeah, I'm sure you feel I, the same I, way. Yeah, it's the uh, the virtual learning is not ideal, yeah. uh, especially for the arts. But uh, you know we, we're making it work. Uh, we still keep getting a lot of uh, a lot of good vibes about what we're doing here, which is great. Oh uh, yeah, uh, definitely. We, right, we definitely appreciate everybody reaching out and and telling us that they're enjoying what we're doing. We keep getting people every week, which is cool. Uh, yeah. A couple of new faces in today too, which is nice. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah. So what whatever you uh whatever you did last night, you you lit that Santo, what's it called? That the, stuff? The Palo Santo wood. Oh, the Palo Santo wood. It worked out because I got my my washer and dryer delivered way early today. I was telling Aaron told during you. the week. I said, I don't know if this is gonna be good. We we had a scheduled delivery today. Finally we got appliances delivered. We found a, a company that was willing to come into the house and install it. And we needed a new washer and dryer, so they gave me a window for 11 to 2 today, and I panicked last night. And I told MK, uh, this might be an interesting podcast if they show up at, like, my luck at, like, 3.30. So he yeah. lit the Palo Santo wood and all and that that's it. Away. All, good, so all good, good energy for you right All now. good energy, which, <laughs> which is what we need. Because I'm, I'm kind of bummed on a, on a couple of different levels, starting with the uh, lack of the Cunz Quarantine. I know, I know. Like I said, I've just been down in the dumps lately. I really have. And I, uh, I, you know, I I was feeling the the Ken Jennings Jeopardy vibe, and you just you just killed. <laughs> you were going for the streak. You were going for that going streak. For the streak. The streak is still alive though. It it'll pick up again. I'm gonna get it going. I'm running out of art topics too. You know, every week I try to do a different art topic. We'll do uh, famous. We did famous paintings of the Met. We did uh, famous cartoons. We did uh, what else colors did we do? was one. Yeah, we colors did a color. We did a logo design one. You know, I'm trying to approach it in a different and creative way each week, but uh, I'm running out of ideas and under motivated, but I'm gonna, <laughs> I will get it back <laughs> only because I want to see how long that streak will continue. Although there's some people in here now that are listening that, you know, that see you with the target on your back. They're going for it. That's now. fine. Uh, Bring it on. Bring <laughs> it on. Heavy, heavy is the head that wears a crown. I'm, I'm good with that. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, last night I was a little bummed because, uh, you know, um, in January I was named by the Hexham Museum here on Long Island as one of their 18 selected um, emerging artists for their emerging artist program in 2020, which is an annual thing they do every year. So it was nice. I was only 18 out of about 500 applicants and I was named one of them. And last night was supposed to be uh, my artist talk and I was supposed to exhibit this week in the museum, which would have been really cool. Uh, so a little bummed about that, but uh, on the bright side, they they met with me this morning on Zoom, and, and uh, we're going to do an Instagram takeover next week of the Hexer Museum's Instagram account. So on Wednesday next week, be on the lookout for that. I'll, I'll be posting a little bit about my process and the studio stuff and what I'm working on and, and put that out to the Hexer Museum. And, so I, and I, hope, I hope that we see posts, stories of people oh, mentioning stories you and, and your stories. stories and that whole I'll rabbit. work on you, it. You got to get that going. You got to get that. I will work on that. But uh, no stranger to exhibiting and showing is our guest today. We are, Mike and I are in uh, fanboy mode a little bit right now yeah, because absolutely. we have Aaron Nagel with us from the Bay Area, Oakland, California. Aaron, welcome to the program, my friend. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. We have been, we have been gunning to get Aaron involved some way, shape or form for years uh, MK and I were very lucky to have met Aaron about two years ago. Uh, he had his one-man show at uh, Lions Weir Gallery here in Manhattan in Chelsea. Uh, and so Mike and I went out on a really brutally cold night. Oh, so it was cool. it was so cold that night, and uh, and MK and I were like, no, we did we got to go out and see it. So we went to. Did uh, you guys come? Did you guys come on the actual the opening or the rescheduled opening? 
I yeah, think it was the opening. Almost, I think it was the. I think it opening. was the opening. Yes, it was. I, I forgot it was rescheduled. There was a there was a bomb cyclone on the day of the opening, which I think was a Thursday, and then they so uh, the morning of the opening they pushed it to Saturday, but we still were there for the opening because I think we were there on that. Thursday. Yes, we were there on that Thursday. We definitely were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't much warmer on the on the Saturday. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> That well, was a rough. From that was a rough winter. That winter here, yeah, at least. That, yeah. that was. That was. But I, I had reached out to Aaron before that. We tried to get him to do the, uh, the visiting professional artist series with the Skype kids in, in the portfolio class, and you know him being on the West Coast, it was, the timing always was off. So finally, we, we got to meet him in person. He's just a class guy, just awesomely talented. And MK and I were just thrilled to get to see the work in person. And then, as soon as the quarantine hit. And we were going through who we want to try and get on this podcast. I said, we got to get Aaron Nagel, dude. We got to reach out and see if he'll do it. And sure enough, here he is. I'm excited. So, yeah. So, I mean, we're going to kick it right off. It, it, if you're not familiar with Aaron's work um, and you are a fan of figurative art, this guy is like the creme de la creme. When you find out what his schooling background is, uh, I think you're going to be even more impressed because uh, I have decided, Aaron, that you are straight up an alien. <laughs> because the the ability level that this man shows with figurative painting, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got involved and what you started originally doing? Because that's what makes it so uh, Yeah, so I was a, I mean, I've been an art person my whole life. I, was, I drew when I was a little kid and painted the walls in my bedroom and it was super into graffiti uh like in junior high um but I would never my dad was a musician and I was a uh in high school I joined a, like a punk band and started touring with that band so my I was on a music path for a while we toured through um time when I was about 16 until I was maybe 22 was full-time touring um, in Europe. Full time. Yeah, yeah. We were doing like eight, eight to ten months out of the year was, was touring. So I was doing, I was doing, I was certainly had no um, professional art aim at that point at all. I was just. And even in, in high school too, like you're not taking, are you taking classes like. I like, took art. How's that like working? The, the normal art classes they have in high school. It wasn't any particular like elective or anything. Weirdly, I, I, my plan was never to be an artist, but it was to be a musician, which is just as silly. <laughs> like, like it's, it's just as hard to make a living doing that than it is doing art. But for right. some reason, art never seemed like an option, and music did seem like an option because I had, uh, you know, from a young age, you could go out and play and make money and go tour, and like it was fairly sustainable. Mm, uh, right. And, then and your dad was a was your dad a touring musician, a professional touring yeah, musician? Yeah, yeah. He did more. He was a jazz musician, so it wasn't. It was a totally different genre. Um, right. And when we were growing up, like he always had a normal job to supplement the music, which was a very handy thing to learn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Also, yeah. as an artist. Yeah. Like, MK, MK, you're going to ask uh, instrumental or, or vocal? Of course, yeah. I have to know what uh, what instrument did you play, or were you a vocalist? He was a he was a piano player. What about you, though? Oh, I played. Tr I played. I grew up playing piano, and then I played trumpet. And in the punk band, I was the trumpet player. It was like a punk ska band. Oh, okay. All right. Wow. Then, what was the name of the band? It was called Link Eighty. Link Eighty. Link Eighty was the name of the band. Yeah. Can we pull uh, them up at some point and find that discography? Is that still out there oh, yeah, somewhere? Yeah, 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 you can get to it. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so that that was my career path for a while, and then in my uh, we the Link eighty guys switched into another band. I played guitar in that band, so it was a music thing. And then um, I started doing shirt designs and album covers for other bands. Yeah. Um, and building websites and just trying to get into that the business side of the band thing to try and you know once we were old enough where we had to like start thinking about paying rent and <laughs> utility yeah. and that stuff yeah. like we go on tour and then come home and then money would have to last for the time we were home until we could go back on tour 
And the right. older we got, the harder that <laughs> that transition yeah. was. Yeah, uh, for sure. So, but so the 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 art stuff started like when I was twenty two or twenty three. I started doing illustration stuff for other bands, and that was the kind of the start of it for me for with with painting. Um, so no schooling whatsoever. No, I so when no, <laughs> so I would have gone to college if the band thing didn't happen and I wasn't touring uh I would have gone to college but it would have been a music I would have been doing music so I, I wouldn't have had I even been available to go to art school I wouldn't have gone to art school <laughs> I would have really gone. it just uh, wasn't on your radar at that at that point in time no and and when we stopped touring full-time and I started doing more art and uh website design and illustration like a, on a freelance basis i kind of looked into going to art school initially and immediately was just the the cost of like the schools in the bay area you know at the time yeah. ccac was the cheapest and i think it was like 22 grand a year yeah 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 so i didn't uh didn't go to art school yeah wow at what point does it become a full-time thing for you gravitating now from music you're starting to do you know the designs and stuff and the t-shirts and the album covers and then when does it click and you say hey you know what this is something i want to do for the rest of my life uh like 2008 i think was my first i was painting enough where people were starting to like tell me i should show and i was going to shows and i had some some galleries and some artists on my radar um uh, and it wasn't until like 2008 that that a friend kind of like committed me to a show in order to get me into the I think like most artists I had a like I'm not I'm not ready to show kind of thing right, like I, right. which would have gone forever probably like yeah. I, you know the paintings are never done I never am happy with them so I'm never ready um, yeah so that sh that first initial show which was in like a retail space got me into a year later doing a show at shooting gallery which was okay. a super like prominent kind of uh street art new contemporary gallery that's not there anymore in in san francisco um and that was the that was the jump off sean barber showed there and a, and a bunch of bunch of great artists it was a it was a great yeah. gallery Time. Yeah, I was going to ask you about your connection to Sean because Sean, I'm a big fan of his work too. How did you hook up with, if you're not familiar with Sean Barber, Sean Barber is a, he's a painter and he's also a tattoo artist. Yeah. Correct? Very, yeah. very well known in the tattoo industry. Mm -hmm. um, how did you get hooked up with him? Because I know that there's a, a really close relationship. He's almost like a mentor to you, right? Yeah, he, um, I was aware of him when he moved, he was a Ringling school guy in Florida. Mm -hmm. And he moved to the Bay Area, and I was kind of aware of his art at the time. Um, I was introduced to him through a good friend of mine who's a tattooer named Grimey, who was tattooing my, been tattooing me for 22 years or something. Um, right. And me and Grimey was getting a oil painting lesson from Sean. This was, Sean hadn't started tattooing yet, but he was right. into the art form. I was into the art form. Grimey introduced me to Sean. Um, and that's, that's how I met him. So we were friends when he was working up in the Bay Area, and then he moved to LA a couple of years later and started tattooing. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. MK and I look at your stuff, and it's so classical. And the approach, if you've ever seen um, Aaron's Instagram feed, he does a lot of videos, and he shows like a lot of process shots of what he does. You have a very, very classical approach to painting, underpainting and glazing. And where did you pick that all up without taking any kind of really traditional college classes? Uh, I just figured it out mostly. Yeah. Oh my God. That, and that's it's why unreal. that is why I believe he's an alien. It's just like <laughs> yeah, I mean, the the it's important to say that like even though I didn't go to college, I still talk to as many artists as I could and like research stuff. And you know, you still I, did I, the, you still did the work basically. You still did the work and I, you know, I heard that there was a thing called glazing and then I looked it up, what's glazing? <laughs> and then yeah, I, right. I, I added glaze and like uh, a key moment for me with, with Sean Barber was that 
when I first started doing um, figurative stuff, I was painting a lot of, uh, I was painting using flesh tones, you know? Mm -hmm. It means yeah. when I transitioned from acrylic to oil paint, I just bought a whole bunch of flesh tone oil paint and then was trying to paint figures with flesh tone colors, which doesn't really work. No, right. It, everything just looks muddy and, and weird. And, and when I met Sean, I talked to him and he said, well, you know, you should, try doing it with these five colors or something. So he gave me a limited palette and he was like, you can do that with these five colors. And that was and all so he you, said, really. Yeah, so and, and that was it. And he kind of just threw you to the wolves yeah. and said, figure it out. Yeah, I mean, it was like a, t a 10 minute conversation that totally changed my, the way I painted because I just threw away all the flesh tone colors. I bought a white, a yellow, a red, <laughs> a blue right. probably, right. and then, just worked with those for a while until I kind of got the hang of it with, with those colors. And that is that still how you do everything? Is that your approach still? Um, you mean with a limited palette? Mm -hmm. uh, no, it's, I, I like working with limited palette, but I also enjoy working with tons of colors. So it's, right. it's much more, I don't use flesh tone colors. <laughs> you don't? No, you don't. but my, my palette is very like, I like to, I like to paint with, you know, if I'm starting a painting, I usually have 12, 10 or 12 colors on the palette just for fun. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Uh, yeah. As you're going through, like, do you do studies at all first? Do you test things out or you just jump right in? Not really. I just jump right in. Yeah. Uh, this guy's killing me. No, okay, no planning, <laughs> no like composition, planning, studies, anything. Like I do. I do a lot of uh, digital composition. Okay. So I work from photo reference. Um, almost all of which I take myself, the mm -hmm. photos. Yep. Um, I put them in, I'm super proficient in Photoshop for my other, other of like freelance work doing illustration and websites and stuff. So I'll, I'll do a full mock of the painting in Photoshop with lots of uh, layers and I'm, I'm looking at panel sizes in Photoshop and mm -hmm. all the color to editing and taking a hand from this shot, putting it on the hand from this shot. I mean, there is some type of planning and there is some. Yeah. Yeah. So some, I mean, some of the paintings have weeks of Photoshop work behind them. Some of them, okay. some of them don't have any, yeah. um, very little. And then I'll use that as my reference for the painting. So it's pretty, usually by the time I start the painting, I'm, I'm 90%, 95%. This is exactly what it's going to look like. I've made all the decisions at that point. Yeah. Right. Right. But, but you're, you're actually sounds like you're making a composite image. Oh, right? yeah. You're taking, you're taking pieces from that. How many, on average, how many shots are you taking of that model before you decide, you know, what you're going to pick from? I mean, I'm taking like 600 to a thousand shots in a, you wow. know, in a photo shoot. Wow. Um, and are you self-taught photographer too? Yeah, but yeah. of course he is. Why wouldn't he be? I don't know. I mean, it, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. what? I had, everything I, you touch, you, you feel like you have a good yeah. feel for. It. You're you're a quick yeah. learner at a lot of yeah. things. Yeah, I did. I had an ex girlfriend who was a photographer at one point. She taught me how to light stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so I have all that gear. Weirdly, yeah. I don't. Uh, I've always had a like. You can probably tell from this conversation that I'll I'll do a thing as a hobby and then I'll turn it into a job. Yeah. Right. Which is, which is, which has its benefits and its drawbacks, <laughs> but <laughs> photography, photography was one of those things that I, I don't really enjoy. I don't like, I don't really like that process at all. Yeah. It's not, right. um, you know, I've been taking photos for paintings for 20 years or 15 years with really nice gear. And I still don't really technically know, know, my way, or I just, it does not gonna, like apertures and shutter speed and ISO, I'm like, meh, like, right. I, I don't, I don't like it. Um, so that's actually, that's actually part of the process going forward that I'm really trying to work on. Like I, I have a good handle on painting. I'm always trying to get better at painting, but the photo shoot reference, uh, composition, all that stuff, part of the process, I'm really actively trying to like improve and change right now. Okay that my because I feel like that's from a like personally I feel like that is holding my painting back more hmm. having the really? reference yeah, yeah like I think technically I can do all this stuff and I want to do all this stuff but often it's the like where I want where does that come from I need I need better reference I need more 
bigger shoots and more production and lots of stuff happening. The paintings I like, uh, you know, from history and from the, the artists I like, have a lot of stuff going on. Uh, right, right. Which when, I, too. when I do yeah. my own shoots, it's hard. To, it's really hard to like get all that stuff. I don't really enjoy it, so I'm trying to get through it kind of fast. <laughs> it's pretty hard to wrangle models and production people, and like that's a whole, that's a whole other job and specialty that I'm just not that great at. Yeah, it's interesting too. Right. Like you know, hearing you speak, like your whole, your whole process, and even from when we spoke the other day, your whole process is you. You really have so much ownership over all your work, from the fact that you're you get the models, you shoot the photos of them, you, you Photoshop your references, you create your references, you create your pieces, you know, you're managing your Instagram, you're trying to sell your work, you're trying to get your work out there. I mean, there's, there's so much to your art career besides just the painting, which is, you know, it's crazy that, you know, yeah. people, people forget that. People forget that it's more than just the painting. Yeah. And for, and for you, Aaron, what do you find is the toughest part of all of that? Like, what do you struggle with the most? with all of those elements? Um, uh, I mean, the, the photo reference is, is tricky. Uh, I've been doing it long enough so I can, I'm, I'm really good up to a certain point. But they're right. like, lately I've been trying to collaborate with other photographers and some production people and some mm -hmm. film guys to yeah. see if I can come up with some other stuff. Like I, it's been really important to me in the past to, to have full ownership of the process. Where like I'm the one that pushes the button on the shutter, so that that picture is entirely me. And I'm kind of leaning away from that now that now that I've noticed the reference is so important. If I'm if I'm there and contributing to the shoot and trying to I'm offering as much input and trying to direct it as much as possible, I don't necessarily have to be the one to push the button. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. It's almost uh, it it has almost like a Warholian feel to it, where as long as you're you have your quote unquote fingers on something about yeah. it. So like the idea conceptually is still yours. Still yours. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, so I'm, I'm kind of uh, exploring that option um, more, but all the business stuff associated with it is hard. <laughs> like yeah. the doing that, having to be a promotional person for yourself. Um, I mean, that's another thing where, you know, some artists are really, really good at being, their own sales guys uh, and and really attractive personalities and on on Instagram and you know and some aren't and and I think of the the process of being an artist where you're by yourself in a room for most of the time doesn't necessarily lend itself to being like a really good business guy or <laughs> a really good social media guy yeah so, or extroverted or anything like that well, it's yeah. like anything else nowadays like you know in the art world especially to get to get out there you have to be a little bit well-rounded you have to be able to to do multiple types of things i think that's yeah. a, an important thing yeah to, we yeah. talked about you know we when we talked with aaron earlier in the week you know we did the pre-check we mentioned how he relies so much on his social media and how he feels about the role of the gallery with the artist and, and where that can take you. Why don't we touch base on that a little bit? Cause he was associated with lions. We are here in New York for a while and now you're not. So what makes the decision for you to say, you know what, maybe the gallery isn't the, the route I want to take because you know, we have kids who think that that's above and beyond what they're capable of doing anyway. So how does that change for you? I mean, I've not, I've not had many like, Thankfully, I think this is kind of a good thing. Over the course of my career, my dealings with galleries have been super, um, not very formal. There's never like, sign a contract, you're with us now, here's the rules. Yeah. Or we're not gonna work together anymore. Like we, almost all the galleries I've ever worked with have been, have been pretty mellow. It's kind of a mutual understanding. We taught, we have a conversation. Um, so, the the steps I take there are kind of just based on what's what, how things are going, right? If if right. I'm doing group, sh I do a lot of group shows with a lot of galleries. That's a that's a really good way to kind of spread out spread out work and see where you have collectors and see what galleries are doing well for you in that in that sense, mm -hmm. right? Like, mm -hmm. yep. 
So I think a lot of those decisions are kind of made by just the business. If you, if you are working with some gallery doing group shows, they're doing okay selling your work, then they'll kind of follow up with like, hey, mate, let's do a two person or a three person or a solo show at some point, see how it goes. If that show does well or doesn't well, go well or how, how well you work with them, that kind of dictates the next step. So maybe in right. another, another two years, they circle back and say like, hey, let's do it again. So that's, right. that's really how it's been. I mean, the, the, the tricky part is that, you know, I paint fairly slow. It takes me a long time to come up with a full show of painting. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of time involved. Like, you know, I'm booking shows a year and a half in, in, in advance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But how much time do you put into, how much time do you usually put into one of your pieces? Uh, a couple weeks to a couple months. Do you work on multiple pieces at one time? If I have to, but it's not my preference. Okay. Yeah. I like, um, I like to get like 80, 80% 80 through a painting mm -hmm. before I start something else. If, okay. if I'm going to start something else. Now, will you um, shoot, will you shoot all your references? Like we spoke about before, will you shoot all your references for the series or is it, I shoot this reference, then I do this painting, then I reshoot references. It's kind of half, it's kind of half and half. Yeah. 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 Usually I'll shoot a bunch of reference and then that will, kind of give me how close I am with what I want to be painting. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that whole like, here's what I want to paint, go shoot the reference for the painting. That, that process again is pretty hard for me. Yeah. So it's, I'll have an idea, I'll go do the shoot. The shoot will be totally different than the idea I have. I'll bring it back and go like, some of this worked, some of this didn't. Now I'll have to go do another shoot. Um, that, that part of the process is super duper time consuming. It's really frustrating. Um, also, yeah, I usually yeah. have, to, I usually go to LA to do the shoots too. So there's like, it's really added. Uh, <laughs> is and, there a particular reason for that? It's just, is that it more accessible for the models that you're looking for? Yeah, it's, but I lived down there for a couple of years, but it's in the, in the Bay area, the, the model industry is, just really different so it's much right. harder there's so much planning and all that stuff that goes into it that it's so much harder to do it here where like mm -hmm. i you know i can book a model and like maybe that will probably fall through <laughs> you know there's a 50 percent <laughs> chance that that's not going to work yeah. right to be fair most of these models are donating their time so often they're interested in the process i'm not paying them mm -hmm thousand dollars like they would normally get paid for a for a campaign these aren't art models right. generally, they're fashion models yeah right okay which we, we, which we can get to in, <laughs> later there's a really really big difference um yeah. in la the industry is so big down there and there's so many people doing production stuff that i can go down there for a weekend book six models three of them will come through <laughs> I'll have, I'll be able to, you know, and I'm, it's, right. if I need to rent out of this, like, it's very easy if I need to find this thing, if I need to go shoot in this atmosphere, it's, it's all there. It's all, it's a production town. So let's touch base on the models then. What, what is it about the difference between the art model and the quote unquote fashion model? And why do you have a preference or do you have a preference for either one? Well, I do that. I mean, the, the, to me, the biggest difference is art models are used to, uh, like live, it's live posing. Yeah. Fashion models are, are but photography. So right. I'm doing photography. So I need the person that's, that's their specialty. And it's a really different, you know, I don't know anything about it personally, but like I can see. It's a different a skill set. Yeah. It's a totally different skill set. And it's a, actual, it's a skill. Like there are models yeah. that like, don't look like models and they, you, Put it, pick up a camera and they turn it on. And you're like, oh God, that's crazy. And then, and then it goes <laughs> off. Like as soon as you press the button, they're done. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's cr it is uh, crazy. It is crazy. Yeah. So the, and I'm not, you know, again, I'm not a photographer. I'm not going in with much of a plan. I have, I know what they look like. I like their look and I've seen some of the work that they've done and that's it kind of. And so I'm really relying on them helping the shoot. Yeah. Right. Like helping it look right. good. So I'm not, right. I'm, I'm doing very little like uh, directing, like do this pose, like look exactly like this. I'll, we'll kind of start and then things will start going in a certain direction that I like. And then I'll start getting, giving input. So right. the, the models right. that work, I tend to usually 
work with a lot for a while. Like there's models I painted 20, 20 times. Um, wow. They're, they, they get it like the painting. And it becomes, um, it, yeah, it becomes easier too, because there's a relationship that develops between. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and that's really, that's really a special cool thing that happens every so often where I'll work with somebody and it, it's easy and the painting come out good and every, you know, I'll, I'll look at the photos and there'll be a, a hundred to pick from instead of one, you know, right. that's, that's right. like a really nice, <laughs> you know, when that yes. happens, it's yep. super nice. It's uh, like finding gold. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. 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 So, so you do preview from what it sounds like you do preview the models first to get an idea of who you want to work with. And then, yeah. like you said, you don't really plan it out, but do, when you see a model, do you suddenly think, start thinking composition and clothing and lighting and all that, or does that come yeah. with the shoot? No, I, I do to a certain extent. Yeah. Usually, you know, when you see a model's work, you're seeing other people's photography. Right. And, but that is kind of gives you an idea of what, they look like like for me facial expression and kind of the mood coming from the shoot is is most of what i'm focused on right, uh, right. so I'll, I'll know like if they can do a certain look you know there there are models that are super cute and happy looking and like if they try and look a little bit angsty it just doesn't work at all <laughs> you right, know right. yeah there's yeah. there's a that you can for me, you can kind of figure out a lot just from looking at the pictures of the models and then right. working with them kind of directs how it goes. You right. Know? And then the more you get to know them, the more you're familiar with what they're capable of, of getting across to what you want to. Yeah. When we look at your work, there's, and, and part of the reason why we wanted you on this program too, is the, you know, the, the connecting theme we say it every week is this, this humanity, this feeling that we're all similar, the feelings that we're all going through and, and doing it together. And there is a quality to the figures that you paint that are very, very human. They don't look like, like if you had told me that this one's a high fashion model, I wouldn't know that based on your painting because you paint them with a very human quality. Is there, is that the direction that you're trying to do purposely? I'm trying not to make it look too posed. Yeah. So that's the, contradictory part of using a fashion model is usually right. like the shots that work are the like in between poses or for most of these professional models the direction i give them most is like stop us don't do anything <laughs> right yeah. Yeah, don't, like, don't do don't do your job don't do, mm -hmm. don't do the thing you normally do like you hear yeah. the beep and then you do this and then they do this the next beep and it's very like if they look too posed the paintings do not work and i've and right. I've, I've tried that so it's you don't want it to look like you're taking your paintings from like a magazine right but, right and so, it's interesting because yeah when we we talked in in episode three with miguel martinez as an, uh, an emmy and grammy award-winning uh, photographer and filmmaker and his whole thing was getting to know them personally first and how important it is like take them out for a cup of coffee have a couple of conversations first is there any time where you need feel the need to want to do something like that too or is it just straight up business as usual boom 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 let's shoot them and go yeah no that, that i mean that helps a lot i i usually don't have the the opportunity to do that stuff beforehand like i said mm -hmm. a lot like I, I don't know a lot of these people initially they're many of them are donating their time because they want to be involved in the process right. and there aren't you know we're they're not getting paid by the hour um so usually they'll just start with the shoot but pretty much right away i'll be able to you know they'll, they'll be a banter or a relationship or like a depending on how the shoot's going and that re that really does help the process and a lot right. of these models i've worked with over and over again become become friends and like we talk about the paintings and all that stuff so the it's pretty rare that a model is entirely uninterested in the process and the painting comes out good. Like right. there has to be a, there has to be a, a meeting of, you know, most of these models are super artsy, which you wouldn't, wouldn't really expect. Really? Uh, yeah. 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 They were, so they're super artsy. Um, a lot of them are, are painters actually. <laughs> like I've met a bunch really? of models that are painters, a lot of photographer models. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, and there's a weird, I mean, that's an industry that's, 
bizarre and we can get into it, but like, you know, there's a, there's a, um, you know, a lot of artists I meet aren't very confident people about their own skill, including myself, um, because there's a, that there's just blew my mind right now, by the way. <laughs> You know, as as artists, everybody on here probably can name twenty artists that are better than them technically for right. all the years, yeah, of course. right? Right. For sure, including myself. Like, if I if I pretend like Jeremy Lipkin doesn't exist, <laughs> I can say like, yeah, I'm a super good oil painter, but I know what right. I, in comparison what, to I, yes, what a modern day mom, you know, master, somebody who's basically my age, I know what they can do. So I'm like, well. So it's, it's kind of the same and it's, it's art in 2020. Like you, nothing's owed to you. Like if you're making a living, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Right. Like, like it's right. not a hundred years ago where people have patrons and you're famous. If you're an artist, like it's, we're not in that time anymore. So no. the same thing goes with models. Like they're, they're, whether they're doing well or not, they know that there's a time limit on their job. You know, yeah, by the yeah. time they're 22, they're considered old. So right. people are starting to like think about. There goes my modeling career. Yeah, That's it. To think about the, angles. So the ones that are getting creative and kind of turning into the art side of things. Um, it's really fun to like catch them, catch them there and you can collaborate a little bit. Talk In a way, it's stuff. kind of like you with, with the band it's like they're getting ready for that that next phase of their life yeah. where you started off and eventually you turned into this artist from the musician to doing the album covers and, and yeah to where you even, are today yeah even when it's going well for all this all the stuff in the arts and i'm kind of bundling modeling in there too but you know if you're a music person or a, a painting person or a, or a photography person you have to be really prepared to supplement it like mm -hmm because you might have to, you know. Yeah, we've yeah. spoke about that in the last couple episodes too, with Frank yeah, especially it's a, it's having- bummer, but like that's yeah. something my, my, I learned from my dad growing up where he was a piano player, but he had kids and so he had to have another job. And you know, if you can't, you, the, I know a lot of artists that are bitter about not being able to have it be their career, their only income. Um, right, right, yeah. But is, the more, but the more resourceful you are, like, like I, I'd like to segue into. We were talking to you earlier this week. Tell everybody what your plan moving forward is. So I'm, t I'm trying to get up on, up and running on YouTube and and have like studio video, tutorial workshop stuff out of my, out of my studio. Yeah, and, he, and if if you've been following Aaron, like we have, you'll notice that he's been doing a lot of uh, lately. He's been doing more live Instagram live kind of things, which are awesome because he takes you through the studio and, and the setup and I mean, everything from the way he lays the colors out on the palette, the brands of brushes he uses, uh, and he takes you through step by step. And it's for, for people like MK and I, who are just obsessed with process and love seeing technique and love seeing each person's approach to the way they create their art. It's just fascinating to watch Aaron's feeds because he doesn't hide anything. No. You just, you you put it out there and say, this is what I do. And this, it's not like, you know, you're, you're holding back your tricks from anybody. You're open about, this is what I'm doing. And why yeah. don't you try doing it too? I think that's, 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 I think awesome. that's part of too, the fact that you are self-taught, you know, you I mean, you probably, since you didn't have that formal training in college, you know, you're learning from other people. So I think that it's almost like you're paying it forward by, by sharing yeah, what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a, there's a part of me that likes the, like, I'm the mysterious artist guy and like don't reveal the, the stuff. But at the same time, the, the reason I like oil painting so much is the simplicity. Like it's, it's not complicated. It's hard, but it's not, it's not at all complicated. Like you're dealing with a medium that is just goo and pigment. Yeah. And it's been the same for 800 years or whatever. And you're just moving it around on a surface and that's it. Like, yeah, I always feel that oil painting is, in a, in a way, acrylic is more challenging than oil because of that. It, with oil, you have that that slow drying time, you know, and the, a, the blending, of, you know, the blending of colors with oil paint. I feel like for me, it comes easier than it does acrylic for some reason. Yeah, there's. I mean, people are, seem to be intimidated by oil painting as yeah. other painting. I don't. I don't really understand that. I really. I love think it's. Like, I think, to me, like watercolors and like I don't even. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 
<laughs> yeah. I think watercolor is the, I mean, watercolor is one of my personal favorites, watercolor and pastel. But uh, to me, like even teaching watercolor, it, it's, it's a completely different well, mindset. There's a, that, there's a loss of, there's a loss of control using that. Yeah. Oil is very controllable. Yeah. And it's very forgiving. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Watercolor is very forgiving. Personally, I, I haven't really worked with it much, which is another reason why it yeah. seems intimidating. Yeah. I think too, with, yeah. with watercolor too, and I say this to my students sometimes, it's like one of the first paints that you learn how to use from like, you know, kindergarten through elementary school. And I feel like when you, at the high school level, it, it almost, it almost seems a little child, childish to them. You know what I mean? They don't think of it as an advanced art material. And I think the opposite with um, oil paint is that, in, especially in our school, like we don't have the facilities for them to paint an oil paint at the high school level. So right. it seems like a more difficult thing for them because it's something that's like, it's almost like forbidden for them at yeah, this, at, at their age level. Which is, yeah. Yeah. So like, but you know, then they get to that college level. And I know there's people in here now that are watching that are in college and they're using oil paint. It's like, like almost like they've earned their stripes to, to yeah. use the oil paint. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so oil paint it has that, you know, there's an element of it that's toxic and it's expensive. Yeah. Like there's all yes. that stuff. There's mediums that people get kind of sidetracked by. Um, yeah. So I get it. Yeah. There's a lot to it. Uh, yeah. But I, but I do really enjoy like, you know, my personal experience with oil painting is there have been times when I've learned one tiny little thing, like when Sean told me about colors, that changed everything. And every once in a while, I'll be painting and I'll figure something out while I'm painting and that will totally change the direction of my painting for the next forever. Yeah. And that's yeah. really, really appealing to me. Like I, yeah. I, a couple of years ago, changed my process I sat down to do a painting and I said, I'm going to try it this way. And now I can't get away from doing it that way. Yeah, <laughs> like it just, really? it just totally changed the way I think. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's what, yeah. that's, what's awesome. That's what drives that pushes you forward. And you know, yeah. it makes your work it change. It. You don't want your paintings now to look the same. I mean, 10 years from now to look the same as they are now. You want to see something uh, change. You want to see that growth. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it keeps it, it keeps it challenging. And it keeps it fresh, which is another underlying theme that we've been talking about all these past episodes is, is keeping things fresh and, and making it something that you want to keep doing so it yeah. doesn't get stale. So, you know, so other than, other than Sean, who obviously has such a major influence on you, what other contemporary painters right now do you look to for guidance or for instructional ideas or for technique or just to admire? Who are you following uh, now? Yeah, there's, so, there's a ton. I, I really like a lot of illustrators for yeah. their ability to paint, like to come up with stuff that, that isn't based on reference. Right. Yeah, I was wondering that. Like, I mean, obviously, you rely so much on taking ownership of your reference. Can you draw out of your head? Can you paint out of your head? Or do you really? really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can make. I can make decisions. Yeah, I, I can. With paint, I can. Uh, you know, I can do a little bit with paint. Yeah, I do so little drawing, um, but I'm I'm very much a reference person. It would be, yeah. you know, especially when I'm actually in the process of painting. So. I'm very much a like, when I'm at the easel and I'm looking at my reference, I'm kind of just in that, in that space. So if I, if I draw something and then put it on my reference, then I'll, then I'll, then it's great. Yeah, yeah, coming, yeah. Up with right. it, coming up with it at the time is, is I don't do it as frequently. Yeah, I always, I always feel that way with, with myself. Like I have to have reference. Like, I, you know, they hear, oh, you're an art teacher. Oh, you went to art school. It's like, oh, draw me this, do this. I'm like, no, I have to have a reference. Yeah. You know, you, have, you know, but yeah. some people well, could do, some people could do the opposite. Some people, they don't, they don't rely on the reference so much. And that amazes me, you know? Yeah. That's a, that's a lot of tattooers that I know. I'm a fan of that, that medium a lot. And yeah, there's some amazing illustrators within that crew people who are for 20 years have been like draw draw a shark with a machine gun and they have to do it within two hours right <laughs> I know. Right. yeah yeah yep. i was he just gonna say like it. like coming up with concept. crazy ideas yeah come through with it and that like some of those guys are just amazing illustrators and thinking about direction and flow and composition yeah like especially and it's not even their own idea you have to take somebody else who come who comes into the shop yeah. basically with no visual reference at all and says like you said oh, i want a shark with a machine gun and all of a sudden you have to okay i, I gotta figure out a shark with a machine gun yeah and it's like they're not getting paid 
by the hour to come up with that design. They're only getting paid for the tattoo. Yeah. So the, the more that, you know, the faster you are at, at doing that work ahead of time, the, you know, if you take, I tattooed for a little bit when I was, when I was younger and it, it would be, you know, if I had to come up with something, it would take me a week to, to draw a tattoo. I'm like, that's yeah. not going to work. <laughs> yeah. 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 I get paid for two hours of that time eventually. But, yeah. you know, so I, there's a lot of, there's a lot of those guys that I like right now, like concept artists and, um, James Jean would be a, a, an obvious illustrator that, uh, yeah. That yeah. Really, yeah. Um, we get that. We've, we've heard that from our kids a lot too. Like kids yeah. who go into il illustration tend to really gravitate towards that work too. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, it's, yeah. it's great. It's a modern day, um, you know, Rockwell or like those, those heavy hitter illustrators from like their right. early 1900s. I love right. a lot of that stuff. Um, yeah. And then painter guys right now, the, 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 ironically, the people that are classically trained, <laughs> and yeah. do a lot of all the prima stuff like they're the ones i like the most because that that's just so like the skill the skill and practice is just so impressive sean cheatham and Lipkin, yeah, yes. those deliberate they're really deliberate painters which is another thing that i'm not super good at like every every breaststroke is going to live there and it's not going to be covered and it's 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 exactly where it needs to be and the color is perfect yeah. Like watching looking paint is the polar opposite of how I paint. Right. It's like being attracted to the opposite thing of what you're doing and trying to figure it out. Do you yeah. do you look to it to help inform your work going forward? Like do you take things from those styles that uh, aren't particularly yeah. like yours? Yeah. 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 I mean the they're all figurative guys. So there's you know, and there's a I have the tendency to kind of over render stuff in my opinion. Like all, you know, if I, if I had the option, I would just sit on a painting for a year and just keep tweaking it forever. Yeah, that's and great. Yeah. Often there's a certain point where like you, you, you overdid that. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. You've, you've met the threshold. Like, that's it. Back, yeah. yeah. So there's that uh, discipline to think a little bit more about the stroke before you put it down or like what, what this needs to be and then be really careful doing it but then having it be perfect, like I, and maybe even loose. Right. Um, I really like that. So, so yeah, like building up texture and all the things that I'm not very good at, I try and kind of glean from those people. Right. It's right. funny that you say that because I felt like when we saw your work in person, I mean, obviously your work looks amazing on Instagram, but there is, there is a textural aspect to it though. Yes, there's a painterly aspect to it. Yeah, basically, I'm, I'm, I'm very much trying to make them look like paintings. So even if they're, yeah, yeah. Even if they're realism, even if they're based on photos, I I want to retain the painting feel. Sometimes it gets lost when you're looking at it on Instagram. Yeah, so, yes. but in people person assume, they really, yeah, yeah. People assume that I'm trying for photorealism, where I think for the most part, if you see a full size painting in person, it doesn't really look like a photo. I mean, uh, you no, can definitely doesn't. see the paint there. You can I mean, there's the, yeah, yeah. And but you, that's especially because you can see that underpainting show through, which is really nice too when you see your Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to put enough, for me, the, uh, in the past, getting enough paint on the, on the panel was, was a challenge for me. Mm. Like just building up some, some paint, especially with flesh tones or areas that are lighter in the foreground. Like I want to kind of get a little bit of body there. So yeah. there's that. Right there's that depth, the illusion of depth or whatever. Um, so that's something that I kind of pay attention to is trying to get, I don't like seeing the texture so much of the panel through mm, the painting. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. And that's why, is that why you use dye bond more than anything else? Because dye bond is so smooth and flat. Um, not necessarily dye bond. Mm -hmm. Like the, the, my main reasons for using dye bond is that it's a, it's super archival. Like I really enjoy the, the peace of mind or like right. this is not going to change i'm going to yeah. one of the first videos i'm going to put up like within the next week or two is going to be a dive on video because it's still fairly new like i think more mm -hmm. people are using it now but i yeah been, it, it seems to be yeah it's kind of, it's coming up and like there's art yeah. companies that are making their own so how much prep goes into using it though i mean is it is it the same as if it was a regular canvas or is it more is there less uh, it's kind of, the, it's kind of the same. Like, and it also depends for me, 
with dye bond is a has a lacquer on it generally that's ultra ultra smooth um and so paint's not going to stick to it at all like if you right. oil painted directly on it it's just going to slide around and, and not right. there's no tooth so i'll i gesso the panels with acrylic gesso just like i would a, a wood panel mm -hmm. and do a bunch of coats sanding in between coats and you know yep. trying to layer it in the right way and so from a you know if you compare it with wood it's similar but you don't have to frame it right so even though it's like two or four millimeters thick it can't warp because there's no it's not porous mm -hmm. um so you don't have to frame it in order to like maintain the rigidity you don't have right. to seal it with uh polyurethane like that stuff goes out you don't have to do that um right right so the the for me the prep is really easy you can cut it yourself like as long as you know how to do this stuff it's pretty easy and and it's so much cheaper than yeah. than wood than than doing wood panels that the, the right. really the only drawback in my opinion is it because it's so thin if you're gonna if you're gonna hang it you have to put it in the frame like you have to right. frame yeah. Right. which you know if your painting's good enough to hang you should put a frame on it anyway. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yes. For, for those of our students who are listening, you know, this is a professional telling you it's, it's important the way that it's going to be displayed at the end. Like yeah. we, we tell the kids all the time, like when we stretch canvases, paint the edges of the canvas if it's not going to be framed. Like you don't want to just throw things up just to throw it up there. You want to make sure the presentation matches the effort that you've put in to actually creating that piece. Everything is tied together. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm thinking like, you know, with all the paintings, even though, you know, some may not ever make it on a wall, I'm varnishing them in a way that, you know, I, I want the light to hit it in the, the right way and I'm framing them yeah. as, as I would want them framed in my house if I was hanging them up in my house. That goes back to, you know, controlling the process all the way through. Mm -hmm. Like being, be having your fingerprint on every single piece of what goes into making and displaying that piece when it's done. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, you know, the ultimately, I even if you know I'll have a show and the show does doesn't do well or something, and I'm bummed on art and like people aren't buying stuff and there's a fucking pandemic. <laughs> and like, <laughs> I can, if I can go back and look at the paintings and and still be happy with the paintings or like the paintings that are in the studio that are old that have, haven't sold. If I can look at it, still be like, oh, I like that. Like, yeah, right. That's right. fine. Like yeah. then maybe they'll sell eventually. Maybe they won't. I'm not mad. It's nice to have them up. Like that's, I think that's the position you want to be in is, is while I could be, you know, I could do a better job maybe with that painting if I did it now, or like I could have made these decisions better. I'm still happy with the painting. And that's right. the, that's the like, kind of the most important part, I think. Yeah. And then yeah. however the business goes. You bring it up the pandemic and, and this, this more quiet time. Do you feel that it's going to inform your approach and your work moving forward? Has it already started to inform your work? How has it been for you to stay creative during all of this uncertainty and this, this solitude? Um, I mean, it's, you know, you know, weirdly in a way it's not, very different from my normal day to day. Like my day is 90% the same. Um, I'm not going out of the house to go to the gym. Otherwise, right. <laughs> my day is totally normal. Um, yeah. But there's way more, there's a lot more stressors. There's, it's, it's different, obviously. And more there's a mind in a way. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like, you know, and I, I'm really, I kind of try not to read the news too much and like, there's definitely been like, I'm not sleeping as well. And like all that stuff comes into it. Um, and there's a part of me, like as any, especially as a self-employed person, like I'm, if I'm not doing this thing for work, I need to be doing this thing for work. And right. not a lot of downtime in my brain because it's, a, it's all about the, the hustle a little bit. I have technically yeah. I have three jobs and right. those three jobs together I can make a living, but right. any one of those jobs starts to dip, which is why I have three jobs, right? Because they're all a little bit like this. Yeah. Then I have to get on the other one a little bit. So if painting right. starts to dip a little bit, then I have to make sure I'm supplementing enough with web design and, and whatever. Um, yeah. right. 
Right. So there's a little bit of like uncertainty that makes me nervous about the this whole thing. Like I, I'm pretty sure nobody's going to be buying hangings for a while. Mm-hmm. So yeah. yeah, I yeah. you know the. I don't ever rely on people buying paintings because it's it's one of those things where, um, you know, the, the cool part about making money or making a living selling art is that you really only need one person to buy the painting. <laughs> like, right. not like music where you have to sell 100,000 copies to make any money. Yeah. Right. Like, yep. you just need one guy who maybe has a decent job that wants that painting on his wall. Yeah, yep. which I can one I can relate to that. Like I've bought art, you know, it's it's a thing I really like, and it only takes you know if you sell if you sell ten paintings a year, five paintings a year, that could be a living, and that only takes three to six people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. you're not well, dependent on the masses, really. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, you know, which is a, which is comforting to think about. You know, you still need those. You still need those people to buy those paintings. But point. the odds are in your favor in a way. The odds are in your favor, and that you know, paintings don't like they don't really age the way that a lot of other media does. You know, I could every once in a while sell a painting that's six years old and eight years old, or you know, yeah. that still happens, and that's that's great. Um, so, I think as a painter, as an artist, you. you Ne- you're never very comfortable with like how things are going because they're always going to dip and right. there's no predicting it because again, it's yeah. just one, it's just one person who feels yeah. like they need to have a, have a pain. Right. You can right. never ever predict when that's going to happen. Mm. So that's true. Yeah. this adds a little bit more uncertainty and sometimes some pressure, like I should be doing more because it's this off time I have, I don't have to drive anywhere. So I have more time in the studio. So you should be painting more. Right. Yeah. I'm using we've, we've alluded to that, you know, in, in previous episodes, how a lot of, in, in particular, our students feel paralyzed more by it, by yeah. so much time. And because yeah. it's, you know, they're, they're just, it's because it's, they're just so unsure about so many things and the uncertainty, they don't have the wherewithal to think about anything else. Yeah. yeah, which I think is really fair and super understandable. And I think, you know, trying to push yourself into being creative and working that can backfire, right. you know, you, you may be in a position where then you're doing bad work or it's like mentally just taking a toll or you're not being healthy because of that. It's pretty important to be healthy right now. So, right. you know, I'm trying to let, personally, I'm trying to let myself take time off when I need time off and, and work when I need to work. And, we are well past the hour mark already, MK. Yeah, it's incredible yeah. how fast I was just thinking to myself, I could talk, we could talk to Aaron for days about, about his, oh, absolutely. About his just, process. We are, because, yeah, because we are process uh, fanboys for sure. Like we just love process. It's just, and to have you come on and tell us about yours is like, oh my God, this is like the highlight of, of my quarantine is that we finally got Aaron, we got Aaron Nagel on to talk about his process. Uh, yeah. We have a couple of questions yeah. on the, on the chat. You want to? Yeah. Cameron, you're hey, Cam. on. Hi. Um, um, so my question was, how do you, now you said it's panel, so how do you transfer your reference onto the panel? Um, it it, it kind of depends on the reference, but usually I'll do a grid and just draw it on there. Mm-hmm. So the, that's why I feel the most confident. When I'm, when I'm, when I'm painting, I don't personally want to be thinking about the drawing anymore. Yeah. Like, and, I, and, and if I'm doing an all prima painting or something, then, it, then it's a totally different muscle and I'm really thinking about the drawing and the form and the expression and all that stuff. When I'm doing my own work in the studio and I'm working from reference, by the time I get to paint, I don't wanna be guessing about if the eyeball's in the right spot or any of that. So I will, I will really meticulously grid out the, the drawing so that I know where everything is right that's so important to hear you promote using the grid because yeah, we, use the, lower, we use the yeah, grid all the time in the lower <laughs> levels in particular you know we teach them right off the bat if you're working off a reference the most precise way to get it is to use the grid and so many kids hate using grids either yeah. because they just feel like it's just too methodical for them or we have kids who just struggle with using rulers and counting out and Right. Like 
measurements and things like that, but it's here, here we go, kids. This is a professional phenomenal painter who's using the grid as the basis for all of his work. Um, Aaron, it's been a fantastic opportunity to have you speak to us and to uh, down the line to the, the students who'll be listening in after we put this up on YouTube. And uh, we want to thank you for taking part because it's just been, it's been an honor and a privilege for MK and myself to hook up back with you again after a couple of years meeting you. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, you've always been such a cool cat with us and like, yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, I'll try that. And I remember that when we met in the gallery. I was like, he's so easy to talk to, so open yeah. about his work. And we said that after the other day, after we spoke to you, like, wow, this guy is awesome. Just so yeah, easy to talk to, so. Yeah, yeah. No, it, I, I it, need to do it anytime. Need to do it. It's that Bay Area vibe, man. He's got yeah, that Bay Area vibe. It's, yeah. it's, it's awesome stuff. So, Aaron, thanks again, brother. We, we appreciate everything that, uh, that you've been willing to give us and, uh, you know, stay in touch. And, and hopefully once we get back to school, when we get back to school, if we can do a, a live Skype with you with the kids and have the kids talk to you, I think that would be awesome. Of course. Yeah, yeah. We got a great guest coming up next week. We'll we'll start promoting that next week and let you know who that is coming up. Another uh, Bay Area person, actually, but I'll keep it a surprise until then. Uh, until then, everybody, take care of one another. Uh, look out for one another. Be safe. Be healthy. Uh, we love everybody. Take care. Thanks for joining in. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Aaron. Living in the past tense. Living in the past tense.